Hey, how's it going guys? My name's Daniel, aka Hashlips, and welcome back to my channel. I am very excited for this video because the Hashlips Lab Art Engine 2 is out. Although it's an alpha, but we'll discuss that. I want to add that all the videos regarding the Art Engine 2.0 will form part of this playlist. This is because we want to record the development journey as new features come out so that we can explain the tool. So without wasting any more time, let's jump into the video and let me show you the new art engine. We are now going to take a deep dive into how the art engine functions and construct it with code from scratch. This is important for developers who wants to develop on the open source software and for users who wants to understand the system. Keep in mind that everything you're about to see, we also have a template for it, which will take you two clicks to use the whole system. But now we're going to build everything from scratch. Let's look at how it works. Firstly, the new art engine lives as a package on NPM, and you can find it over here. In the package, we have two main parts. We get plugins and the art engine itself. For the plugins, they are all separate and they are categorized in inputs, generators, renderers and exporters. These plugins are plugged into the art engine and when we execute the run command, then we get the output. In this case, we get layers of images that constructs a whole image. Each plugin returns data for the next plugin to use. For example, the inputs plugins, they gather the data and store it in memory. The generators take that data and mixes it up and does some layering configurations. The renderer plugins renders the kind of output to a cache file and exporters exports the final output from that cache file. What makes this new art engine so powerful is that depending on the configuration and arrangement of the plugins, we can get different outputs. We can get different format outputs such as GIFs and videos and music. And as a bonus, the art engine supports community plugins. Developers can create their own plugins and create really unique outputs. For now, the art engine is in the alpha stage, which means we are developing on it. And it only contains core plugins, such as working with images and exporting metadata for NFT collections. Let's now jump into the code. If you want to follow along, make sure you have Node.js installed on your machine and preferably an IDE. I like using Visual Studio Code, so you can install that as well. Next, make sure that you have Yarn installed. I like to check my Node version, which would be doing Node-V in your terminal. And we can see I've got version 16. If you want Yarn and you have a version higher than 16.10, you need to run this. For us, we have a lower version. So what we can do is copy this command, go to the terminal and just run it. This will now go ahead and make sure that we have yarn. We are not going to use source control in this video, but we will in future videos. So you might as well install Git on this website, go and download it and follow the process. This will help us get repos of GitHub and work with source control in the future. Now that we are done with our dependencies, let's get to the art engine stuff. First of all, we have a new documentation website which you can find at lab.hashtips.io and here it is. It is under construction, however, in the doc section, we can see the art engine. And if we go to discover more, here it is and we can find it on GitHub. So this page will be updated as we develop, but because it's an alpha, there's no information and documentation yet. We are only going to add that as soon as we do a final release. However, here is the art engines package. But instead of using our core package on GitHub, we can go and use it on NPM. And here it is. If you go to this URL, you will find it, but I'll also leave it in the description of this video. As you can see, we are currently on version 2.0.0 alpha 1. You will see this increment as we do developments. It's important when you watch these videos to pay attention what version is being used. We will usually refer to the version and if there's any breaking changes. 
Also regarding versions, if we just go to the main Hashlips repo and I go down and select the art engine template, which I'll discuss in the next video, here we are going to refer to tags. We can add a tag to a commit so that it captures the code in a current point in time and also so that the videos stay in sync. The first tag on this art engine template is yt-1 and this is what I'll refer to in the next video. But for now, forget about all that. We are now going to simply use this npm package and construct the art engine from scratch. So the first thing we can do is create a new folder. I'm going to call this AE for art engine and then open Visual Studio Code and let's go ahead and open this folder. In order for us to actually install a package from npm, we need a package.json file. We can get that by going to Visual Studio Code and select a new terminal at the top. And once you have a terminal, all we need to do is type in npm in it and hit enter. For now, you can just hit enter until it's done and you should see a package.json file. You can update the name field if you want to. For now, I'm just going to close this. We can now go ahead and add our package. So copy this command and go to the terminal. In here, we can paste it and you can see it's npmi for install hashtabs lab art engine. Now you can hit enter and run it just like that. In my case, I want to use yarn. So I'm going to say yarn add space and the exact same name. Let's hit enter. This will now download the art engine core package to our folder structure. Once it is done, you should now have the art engine in this node modules file. And we can see it over there. So it is here. Next thing for us to do is to create an entry file. And our entry file is going to be index.js. And then we're going to say we want a constant. And the constant is going to be the art engine from this package over here, the Hashlips art engine. But we don't only want the art engine, we also need the plugins. And we can simply import them like this. So we now have our art engine, if you can remember from the diagram, as well as all these different plugins. Inputs, generators, renderers and exporters. Next, what I want to do is create a new constant variable and equal this to a new art engine that we've imported at the top. Now the art engine takes some configuration. So we are going to pass an object and the configurations that we are going to pass in is a cache path. For now, we'll leave this empty. We also need an output path. We'll leave that empty too. Then we are going to need the inputs. The inputs is simply going to be an object. Next, we will need the generators, which is an array, the renderers, which is also an array. And lastly, we need the exporters. And this is an array as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and fill in our fields. At the top of my art engine, I'm going to add the base path, which is the current directory that this application is in. This allows for us to set a custom cache path. We can do this by using backticks and then using our base path forward slash and then we can just simply say cache. Now the cache folder will contain temporary data as well as the seed which we'll talk about later on but just know that the art engine needs this to produce the final output. We can now go ahead and do the same with our output path and just write here output. Many different plugins can exist in one category of a plugin. For instance, inputs can have two, three different plugins. For now, we are simply going to use one, but it works with a key value pair. My key is going to be called apes, and we need to instantiate it with a new inputs, and then we have this image layers input. Now, this is the only plugin we have for now. And it works almost like the old art engine. Let me show you. What this plugin requires is a path to your assets. And the assets are simply named folders. The attribute names such as background, body, clothing, face and props. 
you can name them whatever. But in each of these, for instance, here's the background, I've got some backgrounds. And in the body folder, I've got some bodies. And for clothing, there's some clothes. Notice that all these images are currently the same size. In the future, they won't need to be. But this is how it looks. So this is our assets. Now I'm going to take my assets and actually plug it or pull it over to my project. So I'm going to copy over the folder like so. So here we can see all the assets. Now we need to point this plugin, which is going to in its object, take in an assets base path and the path to our data folder. Okay, so now that is set in place and this plugin should consume this data and pull it into memory for the art engine to use. Let me create some space between the configurations so that it is more readable and we don't get confused. Okay, so now we're going to move over to the generators. The generators field takes in an array of generators. So we can simply start off by saying, let's create a new generator and we find the variable and the only plugin for the generator that we have is this one, image layers attributes generator. Now, here's where we need to pay attention. This expects output from the image layers input. This is how plugins work together. So we know that these two can work together. Sometimes you might find that a plugin doesn't work with another plugin, but then we'll just need to create uh, that support. This will be explained in the documentation once we get to doing a release. Okay, so what this plugin takes in is three different things. We have a data set. Now the data set is a string and the string needs to match up to whatever data input you want to use. In our case, we're going to use this generator for this ape set of data. It is at this point where we need to specify how many items we want to produce. We can do that by specifying a start index and I'm going to make it one and then an end index and we're going to say three. So we're going to start at one and end at three, meaning that we are going to produce three items from this set of data. Now, before we go on, I just want to illustrate something. Let's say we had another set of data from images and we have a total different image set and these were maybe dogs. Then what we could do is create a new generator as well and say that this needs to go from four to five, for instance, and use the dogs data set. And now you can start to see how powerful this tool can really be. For now, we don't have this extra data set, so we're not going to do that. We're just going to simply use one. So let's carry on to our renderers. For the renderer, we are also going to add a new renderer. And the renderer we're going to add, we have two options. For now, I'm simply going to add the layers renderer. And we'll touch on the other one in just a second. So what does the layers renderer take? Well, it takes the width and height. For now, you need to make the width and height the exact same until we do the next release. But here's the height and we're going to make this the same as well. When I say these need to be the same, I'm talking about it needs to be the same size as your images that you are using. Now let's move on to our exporters. So for the exporters, it's pretty simple. It's also an array. And we're going to give it a new exporter. And this exporter is going to be the image exporter. And for now, it doesn't take in anything. And now finally, to run our art engine, we need to refer to the art engine, which is AE. So AE dot run. And we're going to execute this. Once this is set in place, we can go to the terminal. Let's clear it. And then go ahead and say node index.js hit enter and there we go so we can now see that the hashlabs lab ran 
but we got a tiny bit of an error. And I'm doing this so that you can see that the art engine will give you certain messages. For example, it could not find any supported attributes. Now for now, I know that this means that we need to actually render the attributes because it needs to use it as the name for the PNG that it's going to export. So to get the attributes rendered, what we can do is add a new renderer here at the top of the array and this will be the items attributes renderer. Now this takes in a few things as well and the two things are the name and description. So we're going to give it a name and this will eventually be a string and the description which will also be a string. For now we can simply leave it empty and then run the program again. So let's open this up. Let's clear our terminal, press command K. The up arrow will give us the latest command, node index.js, and let's run it. And now we can see it loaded the data, generated, did the rendering and exporting, and it's complete. After running the engine successfully, you'll notice new folders being created. We have an extra cache and an output folder. If we open the cache, we can see a temp folder and a seed.json. The seed is something that if it stays the same in this file, it will produce the exact same output. So even if we run the art engine again in the terminal, it will produce the exact same images. And this is because the seed is the same. Every time you want to run the art engine and produce a new outcome, then just simply delete the seed. That way, if you run it, then it will produce a new seed in the cache and a totally new set of images. Other than the seed, we also get this temp folder with some images in it. And these are not the final outputs, but merely a temp folder for the art engine to use to construct the output. The output is where you will find the finished product. Now we ran this twice, so if we go ahead and delete our outputs folder and we run it again because we have a new seed, we should see that we have three images created because we said we want to create one, two, three. So here we go. This is our first image, our second one and the third one. The first thing we notice is that the naming convention is not numerical for these images. Instead, they use the DNA. The layers that made up this image creates this DNA. This is because later on metadata will use this and sometimes two metadata files can use the same image. So this is why they are named like this in the outputs folder. The outputs are all the final renders from the art engine. The second thing we notice is that something looks a bit off. These don't look like the images are really constructed in the right order. So let's go ahead and fix that. Remember that the order has to do with our image layers input and it takes this base file. So what we will need to do is essentially go to our data and add some tags. Keep in mind everything we are about to change only has to do with this plugin. Other plugins or input plugins might have totally different ways of importing the data once they come along in the future. Okay, so let's add some tags and the first tag we're going to add is called the Z tag, the Z index. The Z index will determine the order that these images get rendered in. And we add a tag by renaming the entire folder and start with a double underscore, then the letter in our case Z and a number. Lower numbers will get rendered first. So for the background folder, we want that to be first. Then we want to make sure that our body is next. So we'll say Z 20. Next, we're going to choose the clothing. And coincidentally, these are now in the same order, but Sometimes they might not be. And then we're going to render the face, which is Z40. And I think you get the idea. So this one, Z50. Now for a normal collection, if the order was predefined by the designer, this should work out. But what if we want to add some rarities? 
We can do that by adding a rarity weight. For example, maybe the navy blue should be the rarest between the blue and the orange background. We can give this a weight tag. To add a rarity weight, we can add a W and I'm going to add this as 5 for the navy blue. For the blue background, I'm going to say that maybe a weight of 10. And for the orange one, maybe a weight of 20. Now the navy blue is the most rare, then blue, then orange. If a file does not have a rarity weight tag, it's by default 1. So, if you put some rarity tags and forgot to put one on the orange, then the orange would be the most rare. Let's now go ahead and run our program. So, we can actually delete the whole cache file. And let's delete our outputs. Let's start fresh. In the terminal, I'm going to run node index.js. And then let's look at the output. Okay, so we can see that mostly this stuff works apart from our faces. Now, normally this data structure will work perfectly fine. The only reason why it's not working so nicely here, as you can see, sometimes the face is there and other times there's a chest. Very strange. The reason is we've included this in our base project as some sort of scenario that someone might find themselves in. As you can see, we've got these two files and they're called old face and old face. Now the reason why they're called old face is because we don't want this to be uh, two separate attributes. We want them to be one attribute, but we want this chess piece, if this old face is selected, to be rendered underneath the clothing. How are we going to get that even right? Well, let me show you. Let's say we want to render the old face at Z index 40, but its partner, the chest, we want to actually render beneath the clothing. What we can do is give them the same name and to make sure that it doesn't create another attribute, we can do double underscore for the old face chest and then let's go ahead and add a Z index minus 15. What this will do is it will take 40 and plus this. It will deduct and be lower than the clothing. Because 40 minus 15 is 25, placing it above the body and below the clothing. Just for this asset, but still making it one attribute when the old face is selected. Simultaneously, what you have to do is if you are in this scenario, you can only give one of these, the main trait, the actual rarity value. You cannot do this on this one as well. So this is a weighted one and this is just an example. For now, I'm just going to remove the rarity weight. But I can see that we also have our robot face and our robot chest and I'm going to do the same that I did with the other one, minus uh, 15, so minus 15, and also with this one, so Z minus 15. Perfect. So this edge case, so to speak, or the scenario is now resolved. So if we now save this, exit, and maybe let's remove our outputs and our cache. Let's go ahead and render them. We should now see the faces and the chests on the correct places. Now let's take a look at a very big edge case. Let's say for our props we've got this backpack. But we also have this backpack strap. And like I said you can see that only one of these can have the weight. Because they're the same attribute because they have the same name. Anything with the same name starting with the same name will be the same attribute. However, we know that this is going to render at Z index minus 35. So we can calculate this. We can say 50 for the props minus 35 will give us 15. So it will be above the background and below the body, which is correct because we want this backpack to be behind the body. For this strap, it doesn't have a Z index because it's going to take the parents Z index 50. So it will be fully on the top. But we know how to resolve this because we've seen it with the faces. 
However, there's a big edge case, because if we look at the clothing, we get this camo suit, we get this eye suit, and we get the Santa. Now the Santa is a bit more voluptuous. So, at the end of the day, this backpack strap is not going to fit on the Santa outfit. So what we'll need to do is we need to check if the backpack was selected, we want to use a different strap. How do we do this? What we can do is basically create an edge cases folder inside the layers folder where this edge case is present. This is where we specify it. So we say that whenever this backpack asset is chosen and we give the actual asset again. So here it is, but we actually do this because it's going to use all the assets in the edge cases. And we say that we want to position it here if the trait was clothing and the value was Santa. And if this is the case, then rather use these two sets, the one with the biggest strap. And that's how edge cases work. So now that we have this in place, if I go and I produce more images, hopefully we'll get to see it. Let's make 10. I'm going to delete my output and remove my cache just for in case. And there we go. I'm going to run it again. So here we go. Here's our output. We can see that this is the normal straps with the backpack. And let's see if there's a Santa. Now I realize that none of these actually have clothing. And the reason is, if you look at the clothing layer, I only have one underscore and it should be two. So knowing that now that that was the issue, I'm going to remove my cache and let's run the project one more time to see if we get a Santa outfit. So here we get the clothing and we can see on this camo suit, this is the normal straps. And for the Santa, it's using the fatter straps. And that is brilliant. So you can do a lot with this configuration. Now this is fantastic, but we also need some metadata in our outputs. How do we get that? Well, we are going to focus on another exporter. This time, we are going to add a new exporter and this will be exporters ERC721 metadata exporter. This exporter will simply take in the image URI prefix. So we've got our image exporter and now also the metadata exporter. If we save this and run it, magic happens. First of all, our images will not change because we're not going to delete the cache seed. We're going to leave it as is and we just simply want to re-render everything and add the metadata. So if we run it, we should see the output. And in here, we can see the ERC721 metadata files. These are the JSON files that holds the attributes, the UID, the DNA, and as you can see, it also has the image, which it refers to the DNA.png, these images. Usually with NFT collections, we upload the images to a decentral storage first. Then we come back and we change the CID, whatever the code might be. Then we need to rerun the application so that the JSON files reflects and points to that file. Just know, that currently the application will rerun and render all the images and JSON files if you do this. Although it would be exactly the same because of our seed, the caching system is not implemented yet, which we'll implement in the future. Now, another thing for all those Solana fans out there who's going to ask me if there's a way for this to generate Solana metadata, of course there is, and you can just add another plugin. It looks like this and it is a bit more details that you have to fill in, but it is the sole metadata exporter. This way, if you've generated your images and filled in your data, you can now simply save it, run it again, and simply see the sole metadata come into play as well. And there you have it.
Now, I would highly appreciate any feedback in the comments that you might have. And what are you excited about the most for this application? And what would you like to see implemented in the tool? Now, before you go and have some fun with the art engine, uh, remember to kind of delete the cache if you really want to create a whole new collection. Keep the cache and the seed if you want to create the same collection, but just add some data to it and so on. And I also want to show you something special. I'm creating a iffy over here. And this is going to be a self-executing function because I want to make this a sync like so. And in here, I'm going to actually cut out my run call and await it. And right after this, I'm going to run ae.printPerformance. And now that I have this, if I run the art engine, I can actually see how long it takes for each plugin to run. And an extra tip regarding the metadata, if we look at the name and the description that are empty, we can basically go to where our name and description is. And instead of just returning a string, we can return functions. So for my name, I actually get the UID of the current NFT or the image. So I can say this is a one or two or actually whatever the UID is. The same with the description. I am passing in the attributes which we have access to and we can extract it like so. This way, if we run it again, we can now get some dynamic names and some dynamic uh, descriptions. And here we can see the name and the new description. So I really hope that you enjoyed this full on showcase with me. Tell me in the comment section, what are you going to try first? As always, if you get stuck with anything that we do on these videos, go to the hashlips.online website, go to the Discord channel and join thousands of devs asking questions because they will be willing to help you out. Also, if you love the tools that we are making, consider getting one of our NFTs. This is Sketchy A Book Club, my personal artwork NFT collection. These are cool little monkey characters and they are pretty nice to have as an artwork. Marco who is the co-creator of the art engine with me, runs the Open Dev crew. This collection is very special and you can read up more on it, but in the Discord you can get personal help and make requests if you own one of these tokens. And lastly, if you value the content we create, please consider subscribing. I hope you're going to have a fantastic day. Cheers for now.